When you're building up a virtual orchestra template, there's kind of a big decision you have to make right away. The arguments can get pretty intense, but it turns out you don't actually have to pick a side. Today, let me show you how we can get both within the same project. Hey everyone, my name is Eric. I'm a composer and software engineer. On this channel, we go deep into tools and templates to help you with the especially technical bits of film TV and game scoring. And one of those major technical bits is how we can set up our orchestral templates flexibly. Here's where we're going, but let's start off with a little demo of what the combined approach actually looks like. I want to record in a trumpet part to connect to this horn ensemble melody fanfare thing that I've already sketched in. And I'll be using a four trumpet ensemble from CineSamples, which is part of their Cinebrass Sonore library. Originally though, it was branded as 90s retro trumpets. So if you're getting any 90s score vibes, it's kind of what I'm going for. I have my individual articulation tracks hidden underneath this folder, but let's ignore those for one second and do what I would actually do in practice and record in the new part on this key switch track. Here we go. And yes, this is a breath controller for dynamics. Wasn't the world's best take, but hey, that's what editing is for. And with a bit of cleanup, we get to something that sounds like this. Which isn't too bad using only the key switch track. I do have one specific thing I would like to improve, and that's this final swell. The attack is a little bit swallowed. I'd rather have something with more of an accent at the front that then comes down and swells back up. And this is exactly the kind of thing we can do with articulation layering. And a challenge right now, at least the way this current generation of key switch articulation features are designed, we can't really do that kind of layering on a shared key switch track. So this is the point where I would jump into my individual articulation tracks. And I just split that key switch part up into the three individual articulations that we have used so far. If you are new to any of these features, I will break this all down more in just a minute. So now I can layer an accented attack on top of the front of that swell. And I also layered in a couple quiet staccato notes just for a bit more of a tongued attack on two of these notes in the first phrase. So putting all those layers together, it sounds like this. We can obviously keep tweaking, but hopefully you get the point. I think this is giving us a more musical result. So zooming back out, I think that composing first with key switch tracks is the way to go, since that makes it more likely that we'll use all these different articulations that we have available. And then after we've finished a first pass sketch, maybe of the entire cue, it's a good time to circle back, drill down into the individual articulation tracks whenever we need the extra detail for things like layering. Here's what this looks like in a real project. And across the project as a whole, I am definitely using my key switch tracks the most often. So I'd say they're doing the heavy lifting, but it is very nice to be able to drill down into the individual articulation tracks, just if we need a bit of extra detail here and there, or if we have to pull out all the stops. Okay, let's break this down in a bit more detail, and then I will walk you through the step-by-step -step setup. So key switches, as is hopefully clear, are a special range of notes that we play not to hear any sound, but to change which articulations that we'll get for the next real notes that we play in. And there are two main types. There's sample player controlled key switches and then DAW controlled key switches. And we often use the two in combination. The first is when our sample player plugin knows about and controls the switching, like here in contact, this particular instrument preset has eight articulations, legato, sustain, and so on. So if I press this key switch for swell, the next notes that I play will be swells. And importantly, which we'll come back to because this has implications for layering, all eight of those articulations share the exact same input MIDI channel. In contrast, you usually have to set up DAW controlled key switches yourself through things like expression maps in Cubase or articulation sets in Logic. Here in Cubase, the key switches that I'll press correspond to these notes in the first remote column. And side note, you might've noticed me pressing these buttons for my key switches. 
There's nothing too fancy going on here. I just have them programmed to play the lowest possible notes in the MIDI range. My video next week will get into why I think that's the best place to put them. But the key thing, uh, pun intended, is that we need to teach the DAW what exactly we want to have happen when we push one of these key switches. The simplest approach is exactly mirroring a set of sample player controlled key switches. I'm not going to show you how to do that here, partly because that's what every single expression maps and articulation sets tutorial in the world already shows you how to do, but also because it doesn't help us solve the layering problem. So how do we solve the layering problem? So glad you asked. We do it by splitting up each articulation onto its own separate MIDI channel. Every sample library organizes things a little bit differently. With Cinebrass Sonore, this first articulations instrument preset will load all eight articulations sharing the same MIDI channel, whereas the rest of these eight uh, will load one articulation each, each responding to one input MIDI channel. So that's what I actually use, and this is the first big piece of our solution to get the benefits of both approaches. So here we have legato, which will respond to MIDI notes coming in on channel one. Then sustain is on channel two. Seco is on channel three, which I'd rather call staccatissimo. And I just like to rename all of these myself to make those MIDI channel assignments more clear. And one more tip for anyone who also uses Vienna Ensemble Pro, which by the way, you absolutely do not have to for this whole thing to work. But if you do, make sure you set this input MIDI channel assignments to all so that all potentially 16 MIDI channels are going to come in to this one instance of contact. In contact terminology, this is called a multi. All right, so that's half of the equation. Then back here in Cubase, I can finish the story of what DAW controlled key switches actually give us. One of the things that you can teach the DAW to do based on a key switch is to change the MIDI channel that a note will go out on for that articulation. So these eight articulations correspond to the eight MIDI channels we just set up in contact. So with this horn line, even though it looks like all of these notes are programmed to be on MIDI channel one, And here that the expression map has rerouted all of them on the fly to the right individual MIDI channels. Then final piece of the puzzle is that nothing is stopping us from setting up multiple MIDI tracks that all output to the same instrument. So of course for the trumpets I have the key switch track and then the eight individual articulation tracks. And just to show you that routing, all of them are outputting to the same virtual instrument MIDI port. Then this third line shows the assigned MIDI channel. So the first key switch track uh, set to any because it's going to output to multiple channels. Based on which key switch I hit versus those individual articulation tracks, which just assign directly to the channel they need to go to. And also note the individual articulation ones don't need any kind of expression map or articulation set. And so if we have notes happening on a key switch track and any individual articulation track at the same time, the DAW is just going to nicely merge the two together for us. Except we do have to be a little bit careful with how they interact with one another. So if you don't like to think about the nuances, my simple rule is for a given instrument, for a given measure to use either your key switch track or your individual articulation tracks like I did in the opening demo. And as long as you don't have any overlapping parts that cross the two, you shouldn't run into any problems. If you're one of those people who love nuance, let's think about what would happen if we had CC1 dynamic controller values with a different intention. So maybe the key switch track has a nice fortissimo and we're trying to do something super soft on an individual articulation. Then those two things are just gonna fight with each other. The controller value will actually bounce back and forth. It's probably gonna sound super janky. I will admit I do break my own rule from time to time, especially if I'm just doing something simple like layering a little staccato attack in here and there. But if it gets more complicated or I'm dealing with any kind of controller automation, then I'm definitely going to stick to only the individual articulation tracks. We're always dealing with trade-offs and this added flexibility does come at the cost of a bit more computing resources from our DAW machine. That's a bit more CPU and certainly a lot more RAM. 
Most sample players are smart enough to not load the same sample into memory twice if there's any shared samples across the different instances that we're using, but there's still some overhead. It's certainly not eight times the amount of memory, but in my experience, it often ends up something like double what it would be if we were loading them all into one instance. If you have limited system resources, I would say only use this trick for your favorite instruments in the orchestra. Maybe third bassoon only gets one track. One last warning, certain sample player plugins, and I will pick on Spitfire Audios here just as an example, don't have any kind of equivalent of the Contact Multi. On its own, that's not really a problem. It just means if we want to split up articulations, we just need to load multiple separate instances of the plugin. But if you're hosting those directly inside of your DAW, a problem you'll quickly hit is there's no easy way to route from an expression map or articulation set across multiple different plugin instances. The reason that I like Vienna Ensemble Pro here is it basically converts what is a mono timbral plugin, meaning it only accepts input on a single MIDI channel into a multi timbral plugin, exactly like what we were doing in contact, except that channel routing is now happening one layer higher. So if you only remember one thing from all of this, key switch tracks are great for initially composing, individual articulations are awesome for next level detail with tricks like layering, and why not give yourself the best of both worlds? Next week, I'll go deeper into how to actually set up key switches the way you want, which is a bit painful at first, but future you will be grateful once that pays off on later projects. If that's up, that will be this video. Otherwise, this will be something else interesting around key switching. Thanks for watching. Happy scoring.